May it please the court, my name is Michael Mahan and I represent the defendants, appellants in this case, uh, Manor Care of Barberton, Ohio, LLC, and HCR Manor Care, Inc. An issue for purposes of this appeal is whether an arbitration agreement that was executed by the plaintiff, Kimberly Callis, upon her admission to Barberton's nursing home is valid and enforceable. The trial court ruled first that the arbitration agreement is not enforceable because there was no counterparty identified. Uh, Can I stop you there? Sure. No, not identified by name, or, or there was no signature by the authorized representative of that entity. Sure. So the trial court does not specify to that level. They, the trial court specifically states that just, there's no counterparty identified. However, the arbitration agreement itself to answer your question, there are two signatures on the arbitration agreement. One from Ms. Callis herself. The other one uh, is actually illegible, but the center representative also signs it. So there's two signatures. We have one, the plaintiff, and the other, the center representative. So here, and, and that brings me to my first and point. And who is the center? If we get to, so. I know, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm. No, I understand. Right into the I understand. Your argument, aren't I? <laughs> so the the center is the counterparty, which brings the question: Who is the center? And at that point in time, the issue of the center the center is not defined, and it's, we admit that the center specifically is not defined in the arbitration. At that point in time, the center becomes an ambiguous term. When this, when the term is ambiguous as to who a specific party actually represents or is, um, Ohio law states that. The court needs to look to extrinsic evidence. What's the purpose of the arbitration agreement? Who is the arbitration agreement intended to benefit? Uh, and for that, we look to the 10th district in Bagiak versus DSL Lang Langdale 1, um, which states that a court should look to, and specifically with an arbitration agreement, the claims that may arise from the arbitration agreement. Who are those going to, to, to affect the benefit? Uh, in this case, the arbitration agreement is going to benefit the Barberton itself, the nursing home, the center to which Ms. Callis was being admitted at the time she executed the arbitration agreement. But, so your argument is that we should look at extrinsic evidence to determine who the actual contracting party is? I think that's a little far well, out there, isn't it? No, I'm, not, I'm saying we look to extrinsic evidence and in the intent of the parties to see who the center is, not to see... Not to, so the first issue is identifying a counterparty. We have two people that signed the arbitration agreement. One is Ms. Callis, and then we have another person. To say that there was no counterparty identified at all would say that that individual who signed it on behalf of the center does not exist. I've not, I've not been able to find a single case that exists in which two people on different sides sign a contract and a court find that there was no counterparty, that there's not two parties to that agreement. That's essentially what would have to occur here. We have, you'd almost have to ignore the center representative signature to find that no counterparty exists. So once we have, I mean, at this point in time, to see that if somebody signed the document on behalf of the center, the issue then becomes only who is the center. And the center is admittedly ambiguous, but at that point in time is when the court looks to the extrinsic evidence, to the intent of the parties. Um, looking to the language 
language of the arbitration agreement itself to say who is the center? What, what, uh, what is that being meant by when the term the center? It says that the patient will receive services in this center, talking about the patient being Ms. Callis, uh, that, the can that the arbitration agreement can be canceled within 30 days of the patient's date of admission. Again, she's signing this upon being admitted to Barbara Clinton's nursing home. Uh, the patient and it's, it's, and the patient moves into the center. Again, where is the patient moving into? She's moving into Barbara Clinton's nursing home. Um, and Callis' uh, plaintiff's complaint admits that at the time she signed the arbitration agreement, the same date, she's moving into Barberton, the nursing home, to receive services. So, looking at the arbitration language itself, of the, the agreement language itself, and the intent of the parties, it's, it's clear that although the center may be ambiguous, there's a counterparty identified, and that center intends to benefit Barberton. So at that point in time, Barberton is the counterparty. The woman who is signing uh, as the Senate representative, she is signing on behalf of Barberton. And this was just a form contract that somebody had basically made up for nursing homes all across the country. This is a, not all across the country. This is a, a, an arbitration agreement that's been utilized uh, throughout Ohio. Okay. Um, okay, throughout the state of Ohio. Yes. So in, in other words, it's a form arbitration agreement refer to a center because then that they can use it generically if they fill in the blanks as to who the center is. The document, yes, it will be identified as the particular center, correct. It has a blank space for it to be filled in. It does, yes, yes. Um, but that doesn't, just because it has a blank space doesn't mean, again, to find that no counterparty identified would, ha would require the court to ignore the signature of the center representative. To, on the contract itself, two parties are signing, and they're not on the same side. If they're not on the same side, they have to be on different sides. At one point, you have admittedly Kimberly Callis, and you have another individual. Again, there, no case. And, and who was that person that signed? Uh, she actually left. I don't, we don't have her, the name of her, uh, the identity of her. She left soon, apparently soon after um, the signature of. Uh, Can we read this? It's, well, I believe it says uh, L. Pearson, but I'm not exactly uh, positive of that. Um, but that doesn't, again, it's not, no, there's no issue that this person didn't sign on behalf of the center or at the time. Uh, nobody's brought that up. And at this point in time, it's just simply whether a counterparty is identified at all. To find that there is no counterparty would, again, ignore uh, that aspect of the, the arbitration agreement. Um, once the court, once it's established that there is a counterparty identified, um, that then applies to Barberton itself, the nursing home at which Kimberly Callis was admitted. The question then becomes, is the other defendant, uh, which is Manicare, um, uh, ACR Manicare, whether the arbitration agreement intends then to benefit them too, uh, because we have two defendants here, whether both of them are subject to the arbitration agreement. Uh, in that regard, we look to see whether the HCR Medicare is a third party beneficiary of the arbitration agreement. Uh, with respect to. And the other side says, well, before you have a third party beneficiary, you have to have a valid contract. Correct. You, that, this, that does presume, again. So that doesn't that could kind of throw your argument about the third party beneficiary out the door if you don't have a valid contract? We, if you don't have a valid contract, you can't have a third party beneficiary of the contract. I, I do, I'm not here to argue that point. Right. Um, but what I'm, th that, the third party beneficiary has to presume that you first found that a counterparty existed. Um, again, so that without, it, without two parties to be found, uh, you know, there, there might not be a contract, but this, going on to the third party beneficiary issue, the court does have to find that there is a valid contract. Um, and again, back to what I stated before, to find otherwise would be to ignore the fact that a signature does exist as a center representative. There's no indication that person signed it not as a center representative, um, that that person was somehow on the side of Kimberly Callis such that it was on that side of the parties. Uh, again, the indication here is that there is two different signatures by two parties on two different sides, and therefore there has to be a counterparty. The question simply is, who is the center? 
that's when the court looks to the, the, the intrinsic evidence. That Do we know the identity of the signature? Do we know that who that person is? You say the name, there was a name there. Yes, yeah, there's, a, there's a signature. You just can't read the signature. Right. It is the uh, employee of... Well, how do we know that? Did you take deposition? Not yet, no. It was just In this case, it was just a complaint uh, filed and then a motion to stay, which we attached to the arbitration agreement. There was no discovery taken in this case uh, at all because... Again, the by defendant's position, um, the arbitration agreement alone was sufficient to show that there was a binding arbitration agreement. This was not. This was a motion to stay arbitration as opposed to a motion to compel arbitration. At which point in time, um, the trial court did not have to conduct an evidentiary hearing of any sort uh, to determine whether the claims were subject to arbitration or not. Um, un unlike on a, a motion to. Unlike a motion to compel, a motion to stay allows the court simply to look at the arbitration agreement itself. If it's satisfied, or in this case, I guess, unsatisfied, that the uh, arbitration, that the, the dispute is subject to the arbitration agreement, then the court can make a ruling. So there was no discovery, um, and there was no evidentiary hearing at that, in this case. But, again, there's no, there has been no indication and, um, that the person who signed this on behalf of the center was not signing on behalf of the center. And, and in fact, just because we can't read their name, they are signing on behalf of the center. That individual worked for Barbara Tin. She uh, was the individual who signed the document um, on behalf, as Ms. Callis was being admitted, uh, to, the, to the nursing home. How much time did you say for Oh, I apologize, Your Honor. I have four minutes. <laughs> Going to, I just want to briefly conclude on my last point of whether the complaint itself is subject to the arbitration agreement. The arbitration agreement specifically states it applies to claims for malpractice. It also uh, applies, or states that it applies to all disputes arising out of the contract, uh, the arbitration agreement itself. The Ninth District specifically stated that that is the paradigm of a broad clause, and that when that broad clause exists, the claims. Uh, the court presumes, unless there is a, the most strong evidence against it, that the dispute bet rising between the parties is subject to the arbitration agreement. In other words, if there's a dispute between the two people who are two parties that were part of the arbitration agreement, there's a presumption that that dispute is subject to arbitration agreement where the broad language exists. But, but that case law also is pertaining to um, contracts that include arbitration within the, the confines of the contract itself. It's one document. And it's very clear as to um, what that it covers the disputes and what is the nature of the contract between the two parties because it's all within the one document. Right. This and this is different because you have your admission papers uh, for services and so forth, and then you have a separate arbitration document um, that stands alone that just talks about the center. Correct. And I know I'm probably out of time. May I briefly answer your question? Uh, so I'm cutting into your rebuttal. Okay. <laughs> so the that you're you're correct that in that case there was a separate or the, the arbitration provision was within the, the language of the rest of the agreement. In this case, the arbitration agreement incorporates the language of the admission agreement. Uh, she signed the arbitration agreement at the time that she was being admitted. Again, to the extent it's ambiguous as to whether what to what terms it covers, we're looking to the intent of the parties and the extrinsic evidence at which time taking in that broad paradigm of uh, uh, absent the most strong language against the arbitration, it's clear that claims for malpractice, which are specifically included in the arbitration agreement, the complaint which says this is a complaint for malpractice, those two are those those claims are included in the arbitration provision. Okay, you're at two minutes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. My name is Todd Mazzola. I'm here on behalf of the Appellee and the plaintiff in this case, Kimberly Callis, also at the desk at the table with me, is co-counsel Larry Bach. I'm going to skip some of it. It's obvious to me that the panel has done their homework and is very aware of the facts of this case. So I'm going to skip right into some of the things that I think are important. One is the procedural posture of this case. And I think as you heard the um, counsel for the defendants say, the motion that they filed was a motion basically that state that it included one thing, and that was the arbitration agreement. 
It included no affidavits. It included no depositions. It included no um, answers, no stipulations. It was just the agreement. The argument was the agreement on its face clearly compelled arbitration. There was no argument as to the extrins any, any extrinsic evidence put on in the motion. There was no request to file a reply to put on extrinsic evidence. That there was no request for a hearing after the um, opposing parties saw that there were factual allegations submitted in the response for them to put on any extrinsic evidence. So I would submit the cases, one, I would submit that Babiak and the other case that is cited for the proposition that the court should, and those cases, if you look at originally how the, the, the defendants had presented them, it is that the court should peruse the agreement itself to determine who the parties were. There's no indication anywhere in the agreement, looking at the four corners, no indication whatsoever of Barbara Care of Man uh, that, that could, you could identify specifically Manor Care of Barbara. I don't think there's any way to argue that that was the case. Those cases also don't necessarily, I mean, they are cases where there was a specific factual pattern in both of those cases. And that was the granting clause of the agreement specifies certain parties. The signature clause was a different party who signed. And the question in those cases was, was the party who signed also a party to the agreement, or were they just signing on behalf of the other entities that are identified in the granting clause? This is a different situation because Manor Care of Barberton is not in the granting clause, it's not in the signature line. There's no way to, there's no way for you to determine, looking at that agreement, and I think everybody has to concede this, that anybody was signing on behalf of Manor Care of Barberton. You can't look at the four corners of that document and make that determination. Again, I would submit that there was no extrinsic evidence put on the record at the trial court for this appellate court to look at, to second guess on an abuse of discretion standard what the trial court determined, and that that was, there was no specific counterparty named in the agreement, and thus it was unenforceable. Uh, the cases that support that you have to specifically state who the parties to an agreement are include All Good, which is the first, uh, first district case, Summit Tree, which comes from this night, sir, or night night district, I'm sorry. So that's basically the argument that I, that, that I believe um, supports the, the trial court on abuse of discretion standard for determining that there was no specific party, um, counterparty, indicated in this agreement and therefore it's unenforceable on that ground. Second reason that the trial court determined that the court, that actually that the arbitration agreement did not apply to the particular dispute in the complaint is it look to the actual language of paragraph one, which identifies the scope of the agreement. And the first, th there are three things that are specified in that paragraph one. And it's claims arising out of this agreement. And remember, this is a standalone arbitration agreement. The claims submitted to the common police court are ones out of a breach of a standard of care um, and negligence involving the nursing home while the, while the patient was admitted. Those claims don't arise out of the standalone arbitration agreement. The second was claims arising out of this admission agreement, uh, out of the admissions agreement. The problem with that is that there was no admissions agreement ever presented to the trial court. There's no evidence that one was ever executed. There is no evidence as to its terms. Therefore, the court really couldn't look to that admissions agreement to determine the scope uh, and whether the, the claims fell within it. There's no evidence of record in the, uh, in the trial court, and there was no request to put on that evidence. The third talks only about claims arising out of and related to any and all past and future admissions of the patient at this center or any sister center. Okay, past or future admissions, not talking about this admission. This is a classic case of overreaching in the language where they kind of missed what it was. I mean, it's, that clearly is not this admission, and everybody would agree that the course of conduct in the complaint arose from the June of 2013 admission. So if you looked at any of those three different aspects of what could bring a claim within the scope of the arbitration clause, 
Clearly, the claims that are in the common pleas court don't meet any of those three prongs. And I would also state that in determining whether, you know, if, if they determine any of this is ambiguous, that there is Ninth District 40, uh, authority, and that's Strickler versus First Ohio Bank and Lending Corporation, uh, Incorporated, that says that basically where there's an adhesion contract, one where there's no meaningful choice to negotiate its terms, the ambiguities are construed against the drafter. And that case specifically applied that to an agreement to arbitrate. So I think, the, again, the court did not abuse its discretion in determining that the claims of the common pleas court were not within the scope of the arbitration agreement. The third argument that we make, that the court didn't reach because it found it was unnecessary to make it, but I believe that the law is if there are any grounds to affirm and they were presented below, we can present those to the appellate court and, they, and the court could use if it determines that the first two grounds are not valid to affirm the case, is that the agreement was unconscionable. That, the court would look at it as, as a de novo standard because it wasn't determined by the court, and that would be the burden of the party opposing our burden to demonstrate. But I think that, it, that this clearly shows both prongs of substantive and procedural unconscionability. With respect to the procedural unconscionability, this case is a lot like Wiscovich, which is the 11th um, district court case that we presented uh, in the briefs and Basically, the, the, the elements that kind of mirror that in this case are that Mrs. Kellis was transported by ambulance from the hospital directly to the manor care um, facility for admission. She was not given the opportunity to have anyone with her at that time to look at over the documents with her or explain it. There's no evidence that anybody explained those terms to her at the, set, at, at the um, facility when she was admitted. She's been disabled from birth. Um, she suffers from spinal bifida. She was also hospitalized for um, complications due to a urological procedure where she had a kidney infection. She was heavily medicated at the time she was moved. Her affidavit states that she has no recollection of what she was signing, that she, that there were, she believed there were X's placed by the person who was admitting her that told her to sign at those places for admission. She was not given any of these documents when after, afterwards to review, and that's important because some of the things that, that the um, defendants are saying is, well, there was a 30-day right to, to revoke this agreement. That's only meaningful if you know that the term exists, and if you don't have the agreement, you don't know that it exists. When she was admitted, was there uh, someone with her that knew her that was competent to explain the circumstances? There was not, Your Honor. There was not. There, there are affidavits to that effect from both um, Ms. Callis and from her mother, who had a health care power attorney. Um, so those, those provisions, I believe, mirror the uh, Waskovich court's determination of procedural unconscionability to substantive unconscionability. The, the reasons we set out is this has, this arbitration agreement is unlike any other I've ever seen, at least, and that it has two provisions that work together that they actually would allow a party to pick an arbitrator that can veto any determination. And that is the first is, and this isn't uncommon in isolation, that they have both parties get to pick an arbitrator and the third pick, and, and then the two of them get together and pick the third. In this case, a little unusual though is that it's not from an approved list of neutral arbitrators. I can go and I can get, if I'm one of the parties to this, I can get any person off the street that's been an uh, attorney for 10 years to be my arbitrator. And then there's a second provision that any award has to be a unanimous award. So that person pick can have veto power by one party over any award being granted. Those two provisions together, I believe, demonstrate a substantive unconscionability in this, in this particular scenario. I mean, if, if for instance, I were, to able, I, were, I were able to rig this um, appellate argument to say, I get to exclude one of the three of you up there, pick my own person to sit in one of the seats, and that, and then any determination of reversal has to be unanimous. I think we would have a different perspective of you know the fairness of the tribunal and the proceedings in that case. So I think there are some quantum of both procedural and substantive unconscionability that alternatively, even if the court didn't validly determine the other two issues it could have determined this agreement is unenforceable <coughs> on, the, on the grounds of unconscionability, which was argued and supported um, in the opposition to the motion to stay. At the time of admission, how lucid was the patient? Her, her testimony
testimony through her affidavit is that she doesn't recall the um, what she was doing when they are. Her testimony she was, was conscious or unconscious. She was conscious, but I would say that there's a difference between there are two different defenses. One is incapacity, and we're not arguing incapacity that somebody doesn't have the ability to contract. Procedural unconscionability doesn't require that the person be incapacitated or unable to contract legally. It just has, it, it allows uh, a demonstration of diminished capacity, which in this case, under the circumstance, all the circumstances, I believe that it shows that there was procedural unconscionability in this case when she was handed this, uh, along with all the other admissions documents, this form document with an X next to it and told to sign these documents and then had no opportunity to review it after she had signed it. So if there are any other questions? Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I want to briefly touch on a couple of things. Uh, first of all, the opposing counsel keeps on talking about abuse of discretion. This case is on a de novo standard. The whether a contract is valid and enforceable, specifically an arbitration agreement, courts apply a de novo standard. Uh, secondly, counsel made mention that this is this arbitration agreement is like no other he's ever seen before. Uh, this arbitration agreement, as I mentioned before, is utilized throughout Ohio and has been continuously upheld as being valid pursuant to these precise terms. The bring your own arbitration. Uh, I know the court didn't reach this issue, but on the subject of unconscionability. Yes. Yes. Um, Those are the terms, Your Honor. Yes. The and it's interesting. How, how, how do you ever get so, to? <laughs> to get to, to the council's position is, presumes that there's some nefarious people out there that we're just picking because we know they're going to stalemate the well, entire. Well, quite frankly, why wouldn't you pick the most uh, person that's going to be most um, open to your point of view? I mean, you would almost be committing malpractice if you didn't do you, that. You, you make two, two points that are brought up by that. One is the each party picks one, and then uh, those two pick a third. And that would be fine if it weren't unanimous. So that, courts have said that's fine. Mm -hmm. Secondly, it's interesting cause, because plaintiff, plaintiff's counsel in their, spot, or their in the trial court brought up this Clinton water case out of West Virginia, which specifically states that an arbitration provision allows, unless specified otherwise, that allows for unanimous decisions. Um, I've not found any cases, and counsel points to no, not a single case in which an ar unanimous arbitration provision was found to be substantively unconscionable, procedurally unconscionable, or otherwise improper. Not a single case maybe that I've found. Maybe it's the point of maybe both of them together. I don't know. I'm just, and, and the court didn't reach this determination Correct. yet. Because uh, um, the whole point was the court said there's no contract. Correct. It's just, it's just a curious thing that I'm very interested in. And, and I've... And, I can just say that I, in my research, I have not been able to find one where it wasn't allowed. Uh, and the only thing I've been able to find is that courts specifically say that you may, you know, the parties can contract for their own terms. Uh, and in this case, um, as the Clinton Water case, which you know plaintiffs cited, allows for unanimous decisions um, if it's specified. Otherwise, if you don't specify, then you do a majority. But uh, if it's specified, then it's unanimous. Um, another thing that was brought up was the uh, lucidity of Ms. Callis upon her admission. She had a power of attorney that was signed, but the power of attorney only comes into effect, is invoked, if she's unable to contract, if she loses that capacity, or if she's unable to make health care decisions. There's no... Mean she had a power of attorney uh, to sign. Was there someone with her who there, had her I'm, power of attorney? No, I'm saying that there was a power of attorney document executed that uh, provided another individual our attorney to make so health care decisions. Correct. Care. Yes. Right. And was that in the paperwork at the time of admission? No, because the, well, the power of attorney, and we deal with this argument all the time, where the power of attorney signs the document, and the plaintiff makes the argument that they didn't have the authority because the individual had the capability to make those decisions on their own. That point puts us almost in the catch twenty two. Is I'm sure if we would have had the power of attorney sign it, the argument would have been that there's no evidence that she couldn't make her own decisions. Alternatively, you give a power of attorney to somebody to make a decision whether you're, you're comp 
competent or not, as long as you're competent at the time that you make the grant. Correct, but the power of attorney only comes into effect if the individual is incompetent, this power of attorney. So it only comes into effect if Ms. Callis was incapable of making health care decisions on her own. The issue is not, again, the council admits that she was, had the capacity to contract. There's no indication that she was incapable of making decisions. The affidavit states, when it was executed two years later, that at the time she executed the affidavit, she doesn't recall everything that happened at the admission. Not that none of those things. Because she was under the influence of narcotics. Correct. Um, yeah. So. Did you have another question? I do have a question. It's my understanding, I believe, as it said, was that she was transported from the hospital to Medicare by ambulance. I believe. I mean, I don't my recall. question is, were the, were the documents signed once she got the Medicare, or did she contract with Medicare at the hospital before she decided where she was going to go? The documents would have been, and there's no, there's no indication in the record, but I uh, I believe the documents would have been executed at Medicare. At Medicare. Yes. So she leaves the hospital and goes to Medicare and signs the stuff when she gets there. Correct, yes. Okay. yes. Council, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, thanks to both sides for your presentations to the court. The court will 